the movement generally. Uh, before that, I worked in public media for a few years. So I was at KNKX and then WBZ in Chicago. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having us. Hi, um, I'm Kay Petrin. I am a data and graphics reporter with Chalkbeat, which is a national uh, nonprofit that covers education. Also do some data for VoteBeat, which covers voting rights as well. Um, and additionally, I co-founded the Trans Journalist Association with 20 other people in um, 2020. So I'm sort of here in that capacity. Um, I cover LGBTQ issues in school occasionally, but I also cover sort of broad spectrum data and graphics in addition to the work I do with the Trans Journalists Association. Yes. Um, and then I also, or the pro chapter, watch the pro chapter. And I'm also a freelance writer. Alright. So a um, little bit of background on this presentation. Uh, we are here to talk about the big picture context of covering trans issues. A lot of the advice is very how not to misgender someone, basic questions to ask in you know, interviews, style guide. Um, but with the increasing amount of anti-LGBTQ bills, um, which have been growing year over year, and this year as well, even just in the last three weeks since I first screenshotted that, uh, there were 430 or something bills when I initially made this presentation and it ticked up to 452 um, in the two weeks that we were working on it. Um, there are some counts uh, indicating as high as 490 plus anti-LGBTQ bills have been introduced in legislatures across the U.S. this year, uh, depending on how you define them. And uh, the bills have also been passing this session at higher rates. Um, the political rhetoric also targets transgender children or adults often, but the bills themselves have much broader implications for the LGBTQ community. Um, and a lot of newsrooms have been dropping the ball when it comes to covering this legislation. So that is what we want to talk about today. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about an overall thing here. This rhetoric around trans people and trans children is not a cultural moment. There is like a very deliberate and well-documented strategy from the far right to redefine the center of this issue and bring it more towards the right. The kinds of things that were being talked about as reasonable positions a few years ago, if you remember in 2016, uh, North Carolina had a bathroom bill. There was a lot of discussion about that bill. That is not an unusual bill today. It would be very much lost in the shuffle of the many things that like, we're talking about here. Um, so that didn't just happen. This is where I'm after reference my notes the most, to be totally honest. This is the most numbers, so not cheating. Um, since 2015, the number of anti-trans bills introduced into state legislators has increased by 2,200%, so quite a lot. And I want to talk about this story. There are some emails that were released last month. Uh, last, last month, Mother Jones published an article about the Christian conservative anti-trans groups that are kind of participating here. Uh, there's the Alliance Defending Freedom. They have an undue influence on the legislative process. This has been revealed through a few thousand emails that were leaked by a former collaborator, collaborator named Elisa Ray Shute. Um, they're not only consulting with GOP lawmakers, but actually putting draft bills in their hands. Uh, that's why you know, each bill kind of has its own special thing going on, but a lot of the times there is very similar language contained from a lot of the same people. They did this with the NTK bills before, so this is not really a new strategy from these groups. Um, Shoot herself was an early face of modern trans activism in the 2010s. She was actually the first uh, person to be legally uh, at the time non states in Oregon. And uh, former soldier, transitioned, and then later, later publicly detransitioned and kind of tried the whole movement as something that she was kind of manipulated into, partners with anti trans groups uh, and uh, radical like feminist activists, feminist perps, and um, 
And it, the kind of cover switch with these emails revealed that she was kind of being used by these people. Um, didn't speak for herself often. Uh, was really kind of manipulated as a, as a weapon. And at this time, she was also taking estrogen. She never really detransitioned at all. So it was really a fiction. She is back to uh, blogging on this again in an anti trans position. So, uh, like people who have detransitioned, like they've been kind of plucked as these sort of symbolic figures. And it is not representative of the entire detrans community. These are people who are very like, close to trans people. They still need trans care, but they are sometimes used um, against others. And it's something to watch out for, especially when you hear, like, there's this deep trans person who's talking about the way that they've been mistreated by doctors. There's, there's always more to that story. There's an iceberg, and I would really, you know, say if you're ever going to get a story like that, to consider um, who, who is this person, really? There's, a, there's always a wider context. Um, So a lot of reporting is kind of stuck right now in answering questions, or asking questions that we really hard to have the answers to. And to cover trans rights accurately, you need a lot. There's medical understanding, there's legislative savvy, there's knowledge of politics, and also a grasp of the far-right lexicon, um, which it sounds like a lot of knowledge, it, it honestly is. It, it's rather hard to keep up with the like, multifaceted aspects of this issue. And it kind of all goes back to this maxim of follow the money, which is like the oldest thing in journalism. Like, who is funding to get these bills on the table? And it's also fun to be, or follow the ideology. Um, because white nationalists and Christo fascists in this country have seized on trans issues because they have this perceived ambiguity in the public conversation. It's a lot easier to sway people on an issue if they don't fully understand what it is or what it means. Um, and there's also this old belief that through capitalizing on social disorder, you can bring about an end to the United States government, which white nationalists believe is an illegitimate state. It goes back to this idea of the Zog, or the Zionist occupied government. It's an extremely anti-Semitic old idea that is interwoven with anti-trans politics in a lot of cases, and sometimes it is fully invisible. There are dog whistles. There's accelerationism, which is the idea that if you are uh, capitalizing on this change, you can bring that down. This is one of those things. There's globalists. There is um, uh, elites. That is language that's used by people like Tucker Carlson. They sound like fringe ideas. Tucker Carlson has 3.5 million viewers on his show. There are a lot of people who are receiving this information without context and is being put on a group of people who are becoming more and more of an outgroup. So, you know, it sounds like kind of a wild, but it is, there are a lot, there, there's a really a lot of background here. So what are some of the consistent problems that we see in coverage of anti-trans legislation? Um, media audits have indicated consistent failure of news publications check basic facts about bill contents and politicians' claims. Um, actually, this week was a great example of that. The Attorney General ran uh, essentially an emergency order uh, banning what he described as youth transition care because of a controversial uh, clinic in, based in St. Louis. Um, if you actually look at the order, there is no limit on the age of people it affects. Reporters in Missouri uh, asked the AG's office about, you know, is this really just a youth ban? Um, AG's office would not answer. And uh, many publications ended up just running what the press release said. Um, I talked to several reporters who had to fight their editors to get in the fact that the AG was not uh, actually putting an age limit in this and was not discussing that. And uh, there were a number of, <clears throat> there, there are also already people documented, that reporters have documented, who are 30 plus, whose care is being discontinued by their doctors as a result of an emergency order that hasn't even gone into effect yet. So that's all, you know, that happened in the last two days and is being actively covered. It's a great instance of news publications are just not reading the bill text and not asking enough questions about a lot of these bills and people are not getting crucial information about 
Um, and you, you have loans of other bills. Yeah, just a couple notes. I've, I've been reading a lot of these bills lately, and um, not great. And you know, every single one of them has a different kind of shade of meaning. There's a, there's a lot of shared ideas here. You know, you'll see sort of trends in language, for example. There is one kind of new one. Uh, it is the idea of aiding and abetting. Some places are restricting it to not only doctors or uh, but to psychologists, psychiatrists, pharmacists. It's very vague language. And in Mississippi, it, it is anyone. It's any person is the language, which means that if you gave a child a gender from a haircut, that could be a crime, potentially. It's left, it's left vague, and I think that's the worry for a lot of people, because they feel very vulnerable. Um, so it's really, you know, like Kay was just saying, it's very important to understand um, that all of these bills are, are worth reading in their entirety, because things will often be lost, even if you're reducing the work of other reporters and trying to get caught up. It is worth taking a moment and um, actually reading the text yourself. Another aspect to this is that uh, the news is still the sole source of many Americans' familiarity with trans individuals. This Pew research study shows about 42% of people are aware that they've met a trans person, um, but a, a lot of what people read is just all that they know. Um, so it's actually important to get it right, not spread disinformation and misinformation, um, and to be thoughtful about who's, who in your story is speaking, who questions are getting asked, who's answering them. Is it only spokespeople? Are cisgender people you know, being treated as the exclusive experts on trans experience? Um, <clears throat> and did you want to talk? Yeah, sure. Um, just about these bills. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's like in Montana, for example, there is like a, you know, that ban also includes public bonds for social transition. Uh, in Florida, it bans insurance. This is, you know, a youth, this is another instance of like a youth care ban but it bans insurance coverage for all trans adults, um, basically private and public, which would make all care pretty inaccessible to someone. Because can you imagine any, any medical issue of any kind being something that you have to completely pay out of your pocket, especially if you would define it as like chronic, for example, because it requires you know, continued medication and or continued services. It's, um, it's severely limiting to people. And there's also sort of the human impact to coverage that makes er errors or is um, generally uh, dismissive or even actively cruel towards the community. There have been studies indicating you know, adverse mental health outcomes for transgender adults pretty directly uh, associated with um, interactions with news. So, um, <clears throat> how do we do it right? Um, so the first question is, why that story? What are we covering and why? Um, how important is a given story within its broader context? How much time, energy, and resources should be invested to tell the story? What other stories are we missing by dedicating given resources to a story? Who or what is being held accountable? What would accountability look like? All the basic News 101 questions. A lot of times we're, uh, we're just not seeing, you know, some of those basic questions are not being asked. Great analogy, abortion regret is uh, a very real thing. It deserves coverage. Um, but when we're deciding, you know, what are we covering? Should the newsroom's best reporter spend a year working on a five-part series on the topic of abortion coverage while leaving the breaking news team totally on its own to cover proposed abortion restrictions and not looking at um, the potential, uh, you know, big picture human impact broader network of stories and impacts, right? That's a lot of what we're seeing right now happening with the coverage of anti-trans legislation. Um, and uh, so in this case, like to speak about you know, commonly what we're seeing, a lot of people get tripped up on these youth gender affirming care bills. It's, uh, there's a lot of emphasis in the news on, you know, okay, we've got six bills in the state. They're doing a bunch of things. Some of them are in schools. Some of them are banning care. Newsrooms are often only covering the gender affirming care story. Um, but when you look at that in context of, okay, what are the impacts? What's going on right now? So we've got 1.6 million transgender people age 13 plus or above. Um, this is from the Williams Institute, which is one of the leading research institutes that actually has 
trans people. Um, of those, they estimate that about 300,000 are youth ages 13 to 18. Can I give a data caveat here? Because the data on trans people is so bad, uh, this is a separate data set. Don't run this as a data story. It's sort of just illustrative. Um, we're switching over to the U.S. Trans Survey, which is where people uh, self-disclose. It's the largest available survey information on trans people. Um, they're updating it here. There's supposed to be a new release, but the most recent one is from 2015. When you, when you look at this largest survey of trans people, only 62% of people who describe as trans have transitioned. Only one in 10 of those have transitioned as youth, and that includes social transition. Um, not just medical transition, which is largely but not exclusively targeted by these bills. So by the time you get down to this funnel, you've got, okay, a handful, you know, a couple hundred, however many kids in a state who may be transitioning. You've got sort of social networks impacted by that, but it's a very, 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 very small sliver of a sliver of a sliver. Meanwhile, a lot of the other legislation that's going uncovered uh, affects, you know, not just the students who may be, or children, children who may be transitioning, but also entire school networks who are looking at book bans, huge disruptions in services provided. Um, you know, I'm an education reporter, so that's a lot of what we're focusing on. You know, some of this legislation, they, the schools have talked about how they're receiving thousands and thousands of dollars of works worth of FOIA requests from some of these right-wing groups that they are having to pull resources off the bill. Washington Post reported on that. So there's huge sort of larger ecosystems uh, and stories uh, that are sort of impacted across this legislation, but this sort of like sticking point on the tiny sliver of youth gender affirming care really has resulted in much of that not getting covered in that. Right, and there are a lot of these, there's a sort of big question posed about youth gender care. Why are we seeing so many more trans children? I just want to like knock on this razor this. Uh, Youth transition is perhaps maybe more common because it is more common to be trans. It is more publicly acceptable to be a trans person. That was not true rather recently. Um, there aren't more trans children in urban environments versus rural environments because cities are, are creating more trans children. It's just there are, there are programs, there are resources. I grew up in Texas, for example. I was not aware that trans people existed until I was 17 years old. Like, I had access to the internet. Like, it's just not something that you necessarily interact with. Um, and there's kind of this analog that is put out there a lot that in the past, left handedness was punished in schools. Kids were not allowed to be left handed, you know, there could be discipline. For writing with your left hand. And at some point they realized, you know, this isn't a good idea. Maybe we should stop punishing these kids. And suddenly there were more left-handed children in America. The statistics just shot up. And I don't think that there was this secret left-hand agenda that was pushing it. I think that it might be that we stop punishing people for being left-handed. And a similar thing could perhaps be happening with trans people. And you know, youth care is not experimental. I'll return to this kind of later and something that's kind of a broader medical thing. But mainstream medical organizations have supported this kind of thing for a long time. There have been trans children for a long time, like the 19th century, um, at least, if, and farther and farther back than the other graphs. Um, it, it's, it's broadly supported. It is evidence-based. It is shown to be effective. And there really isn't some big juicy truth. I think there are some people who think there is, but the truth is that like most trans care and aspects of trans life are truly pretty boring and mundane. It is just something that is different from the norm, and it is getting a, a, a kind of laser focus at the moment. Uh, and if you ask enough kind of confounding questions about something, it might seem more confusing than it actually is. And as we're thinking about how to tell these stories, whose voices are we approaching? Again, a lot of this is, to some degree, reporting 101, right? Who's quoted, who isn't, how are we communicating that to an audience? What are the goals, political associations, and financial relationships held by your sources? A lot of people are skipping that. A commonly quoted source 
at the American College of Pediatricians. It's an anti-LGBTQ fringe group, not the actual American Academy of Pediatrics. But it gets quoted in stories not infrequently. Some very large legacy publications uh, have recently quoted organizations that explicitly state uh, they have uh, goals of um, essentially conversion therapy. Um, and that's not noted in the story. Takes a, you know, takes a single graph. Uh, it's not, it's basic context that is often left out. So then, you know, make sure you're including, you're doing that background, you're checking who the funders are, including that information. Um, again, follow, it, a lot of it just keeps coming back to follow the money. Um, also, is the prevalence of one source's voice, you know, under, over, or appropriately representing the prevalence of the group or the perspective they belong to? With Shu, um, the sort of politically elevated detransitioner who recently leaked those emails, um, you know, there's an estimate about 2.5% of trans people desist or detransition uh, in some manner. People who detransition and are sort of like politically elevated in this way are a fraction of the detransition community um, and are not even necessarily representative of people who detransition broadly. Many stay involved in the trans community, uh, but they're often treated as, you know, we talk to one of those people and we talk to one trans person. That's a form of false balance because uh, it's not representative of sort of the prevalence of the group or kind of perspective. Um, are cis people treated as the only expert sources on trans experience? Are you talking to trans doctors, trans legal experts? Um, you know, there's there's more, there are more experts out there than uh, often see stories where every single source is cisgender on these anti-trans bills. Don't do that. Have more diverse sourcing. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Yeah, there, there's also something I want to point back to history a little bit. When was the last time that you heard anything about the gay gene? Anybody want to grab like a year? Yeah, probably right around when gay marriage was about to become legal. When you had a group of people who were now more fully recognized under the law, we weren't asking as many basic questions about are they people? <laughs> and nobody is asking a question about the gay gene because it doesn't matter. Um, and this is a common argument and it is kind of now happening. There's access to a lot of media reporting that the central question that is really in there is like, why are there trans people? Why are they here? Why are they in our society? Why are there more of them? Uh, it, 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 there is a, there's a, a bias that's there, and it's a cultural bias against trans people that is baked into society. Um, and these common arguments are kind of brought up, and then they're dismissed, and we have these media cycles again and again and again that ask the same basic questions and don't advance any kind of cultural changing of trans issues, which is just not good journalism. It's not good media practice. It's just not good. Um, both sides journalism, I think we all are familiar with, is super lazy. Uh, it does not get to anyone who knows the truth. And if you are going to balance an informed perspective with something that is, you know, that big part of the open foundation of shaky facts and biases and lies and prejudice, prejudice like, like journalism is in these states before with, with race, with crime, with so many things, and we can open a newspaper years ago, maybe the ones that we work at, and be profoundly embarrassed by the things that we read. You know, there are many newspapers in the country that have features of going back and looking at their coverage and saying, uh, this is pretty bad, sorry about that, we're going to analyze why that's a problem. And can we stop ourselves from doing that exact same thing in the moment? And I think that we really can. And, and this is really one of those cases where it's very important because, like, Trans people are being positioned like they're these arbiters of culture, but quite honestly. But like, you know, trans people are controlling America. They're not. <laughs> and, you know, there are more interesting questions to ask about trans people. Um, you know, they're, they're like in the simple and basic ones. I can think of one right now where, like, you know, an interesting makeup trend is that um, 
sort of cis beauty influencers have taken a lot of tips and sort of aesthetics from trans influencers, which is kind of interesting at this time. It's kind of an interesting, like, deepening aspect of, like, maybe how trans people are a part of society. It's kind of like, it's fun. Um, profoundly more interesting and actually a lot deeper than a lot of these other stories that we read that position themselves as intellectual. They are not. So, okay. So, um, we want to talk about sort of what is like normal. So, what's your baseline in normal in stories about trans healthcare? There's like people who regretted medical procedures that they chose to undergo. Sure, that happens all the time with cis people, too, actually, for all kinds of medical procedures. Um, I actually most of my career reported on healthcare issues. It's very much rather common for people to undergo procedures that maybe they don't go well for them, or they don't have the outcomes that they desire. Um, it often says a lot more about our healthcare system than the procedure in a lot of cases. Um, there are also people who choose not to undergo procedures. And then there are people who are forced to undergo medical procedures. It's kind of an interesting contrast. It's, um, it's actually written into a lot of these bills that trans people are being forbidden from having surgery and intersex people are kind of the exception. Intersex people often, in many cases, in case if you're unfamiliar with that term, um, intersex people are rather common. It's like about like one in every 100 people has an intersex trait, which basically means genetically it's only outside of the, the binary. Something that you uh, present physically, it can be something that's completely invisible. But it's a, it is about as it's common as red hair. Um, and many children who are born intersex are, um, their surgery is performed on them uh, at a young age, usually not medically necessary, and it's done to align those children with a sort of cis normative appearance as a way to sort of like help them. And often it has really serious consequences for their health. Sometimes they feel really wronged by that. It is, um, Something that is written into these bills. And when you look at the um, trans bills that are limiting that care and the bills that are also allowing for intersex care, they're doing the same thing. And it's trying to assess at one time. Um, and they're not like two sides of the same coin. They're not like opposed. They're very much like the same thing. There's the same kind of intention that is written into them. Um, and you really got to ask, like, why are the perspectives of people who have the worst outcome and have allowed us to uh, be positioned over masses of people who are in state legislators all over the country saying, I need this health care. It is making my life better. My child needs this health care. They were in a terrible state before they got it, and I finally have I have a happy daughter. I have a happy son now, when I had a very unhappy child before that. Why are those perspectives being balanced like they are the same exact thing, when they are in sheer numbers not balanced? And from a sheer, you know, editorial decision-making perspective, right, it, the way that this is often approached, as Vivian's describing, you know, it would be in, like if a story about abortions focused on those who regretted having one, and compared them to people who were glad they were able to access an abortion, but just totally consistently across the sort of news landscape, often left out with profiles of people who couldn't get abortions and were raising children they weren't prepared for, right? Huge oversight from a news and perspective uh, angle, and uh, some, that's sort of what's happening with this coverage as well. Um, it, it's also important to think about the way that this coverage often prioritizes the voices of certain parents who don't want their children to transition as normal over parents who are supporting their child in transition, or children themselves, or you know, larger family or social networks or professionals in a child's life who might have you know different perspectives. So, when, just when you're trying to figure out, okay, how do I cover a, an anti-trans bill? How do I cover a trans story? Make if you're tr struggling to figure out that whether or not you've covered all the angles and ask yourself all the questions you need to ask as a reporter, always remember to ask the counterfactual. Look at what you're asking, 
Just take the opposite and make sure you've covered both bases. Um, don't sort of rely on the traditional, okay, here are the two sides that I gotta check the box on to get the line, right? Take, take the extra time to think. Um, another conversation I've had with, you know, a couple of newsrooms is uh, it can be helpful to reframe this coverage sort of the way I've been doing with abortion. Would you approach another beat the same way? Um, I was speaking with a newsroom who has a pretty strong uh, racial justice angle to their coverage focus. And one of the things that they did in the, with the Nashville shooting, where the police released some information that was very unclear and inconsistent, saying the shooter was first a transgender woman, then a transgender man, and from a fact-checking and verification point of view, actually no reporters have actually been able to confirm whether this person was trans, and they're dead. So we still do not know. Um, but this newsroom was sort of saying, okay, we ran before we even knew the shooter was potentially was being called trans by the police, we ran a story on the rare female shooter. Would we have done that if it were, if, to, if the shooting were perpetrated by a racial minority or by a disabled person, they were like, we would not have done that because we know better. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of sort of framing oversight that people make with trans coverage because they're less familiar with the issues in the community. Um, <clears throat> What's the data say? Um, so, one of the big issues with the trying to really shore up your coverage here is also that there's not a lot of data on trans people. There's not a lot of funding for it. A lot of the data that does exist is kind of bad. It's a relatively small population. Um, so that a lot, when you're trying to find a data or a study, it's tricky. Um, there's also a lot of issues built in. Um, so, Lots of questions like when we have limited data, are we using what is available in appropriate context with its flaws explained? Really great example of this. Williams Institute mentioned it earlier. Um, they are one of the leading research institutes on trans uh, population estimates. They recently doubled their number of uh, estimated trans youth in the US. Uh, trans stories saying, you know, the number of youth in the trans, uh, trans youth in the U.S. has doubled. That's a huge increase. This is a rapid onset gender dysphoria, just like we said. That's a, if you're not familiar with it, it's a common debunked uh, myth about the idea that trans people meet other people and we all contagionify them into becoming trans, right? Um, so people people use this, even you know, very reputable publications sort of were like, oh, this is a huge increase. Well, if you actually go read their explanation of why they did that, uh, their estimate doubled because they realized their methods were bad. They got more information. Uh, they don't think the number of trans people actually doubled. They think that the work that they were doing was insufficient to describe the number of trans people. Uh, trans hard to get information uh, about trans youth. Um, what happened is the Center for Disease Control uh, changed the way that it collects information on gender identity in its surveys, which it distributes to schools. And the uh, results found a lot more trans students in public schools than they expected. And so they revised their numbers. Um, but that was by, again, very reputable publications as this massive increase that was driven by some of these ideas of social contagion, et cetera. It was just you know, not handled very well. So you really have to think, you, know, you really have to read the details of the data, the trends over time, looking at the limitations. Also, are we reporting as if there is no data when the data is just complex or needs that added context? Make sure you look, make sure you do the extra reading. It's really important to get it right. Um, large numeric shifts, I uh, already explained that one with the Williams Institute description. Um, and also when we're talking about legislation, who are we defining as impacted or not impacted by a bill if it's, for instance, changing operations in all schools in a state because of you know, the five transgender athletes in the entire state. Um, and what impacts might that have on students who are in, you know, sports programs who are cisgender? A lot of those bills have actually consequences for cisgender students as well as transgender students because of the way that the schools have to, uh, would have to change their operations to comply with the letter of the law, even if those schools have zero transgender students attempting to be on sports teams. So how are we thinking about that? How can we quantify that or count that? Um, and, um, <clears throat> so a little bit more, so like common data discussions, okay? Surgery regret is the really common one. Often we're asking, 
if you know whatever percent of people regret, let's say, top surgery. Well, make sure to ask, how does that compare with regret of surgery in general? Um, if X number of people have an adverse reaction to hormone replacement therapy, how does that compare to all adverse reactions or adverse reactions to other hormone therapy treatments, right? Just getting the additional context. Um, Detransition frequency, often really contested. You'll see arguments from people, this is less of a news argument, it's sort of like an audience argument that people make. You know, there's 45,000 people in the detransitioners Reddit, right? So how can detransitioners be as rare as 2% is an argument, which I actually did see sort of referenced at least uh, in a couple of articles, not fact checked. If you actually calculate uh, that out and assume that every single person in that Reddit did detransition, which is not the case because there's a lot of people who are just uh, having conversations, cis people who are having conversations about trans care in that space. But let's assume, you know, all 45,000 did detransition, that's still 3%. So national level articles, you know, running that sort of 45,000 number as if it's this big, oh, it's way higher than 2% and they just didn't do the math. So make sure to do the math um, if you're working with numbers on trans stories. Um, also, basic counts of trans people. Again, as I've been saying, really hard to get. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, research in one urban school district, there's a really good study on this, actually suggests that sort of open-ended, self-descriptive questions about gender diversity and gender expansiveness um, resulted in a five times higher affirmative response rate than the question specifically, are you transgender? And part of the reason that they, the researchers sort of realized and hypothesized that this was happening based on some of the survey, et cetera, and work that they did, was that um, the word transgender is not necessarily something, especially that you know or use, um, but when you're just asking people about their relationship to gender, they're much more likely to say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah that's me. And they might be describing, you know, they might eventually self-identify as transgender and just not be familiar with it, might not, but, you know, it increased a 1.5% average in that particular district to a, uh, I believe it was a 9.5 or 11%, but don't quote me on that, um, when they use these two different survey methods. So, right, looking at the, how the questions are asked, um, in a study, what the letter, you know, what the wording is, who are we actually surveying or counting in something, really important steps to reporting data accurately on trans stories. Um, Another common assumption that's sort of just repeated is that transgender people are predominantly white. Um, generally, surveys of youth indicate that white youth are less represented among transgender teens than uh, youth of color. So that's another thing. There's stuff like that where, you know, make sure you're checking the demographics. Don't just take things uh, at, at their word. Um, there are a lot of good data resources, which I have cited here, um, which again, they all have caveats, they all have limitations, but it's our job as journalists, if we're talking about these things, to look for the data and contextualize it for our audiences. Um, there's also a couple of good books. They're more on the sort of uh, like social work side, so not traditional journalism pieces, but some really useful information on the way Things that we don't necessarily think about um, happening behind the scenes can affect the data we're looking at. So there's a great anecdote in Queer Data about how an earlier version of the census asked initially uh, a question about gay marriage that resulted in a bunch of heterosexual couples being reported as gay and a bunch of gay couples being reported as heterosexual. Then the following census cycle, they changed the question and they flipped the problem. So that, and that was just because of a methodology and an analysis error. error. And so that actually, um, there was basically this circumstance where, where the census was like first wildly underestimating gay marriage and then wildly overestimating it. And neither of the years particularly accurately reflected the numbers, uh, but you know, for totally different reasons. So lots of good you know, discussion on these sorts of data issues if you're someone who's interested in data. Um, from a lens of specifically working with some of these data problems with government data not being the best at getting at LGBTQ issues. So there is this question of scientific consensus over trans healthcare generally. And I just want to sort of pause like a, a journalism analogy. What if there was one person who worked in journalism who very boldly said that not allowing your sources to review and edit your copy was a huge breach of journalistic ethics. And every time you put out a story, 
they should definitely be able to read it, make any changes that they want. And everyone outside of the media was like, yeah, that sounds totally right. We'd be like, what a fucking idiot, right? <laughs> you wouldn't take that person seriously at all. And that would be in total violation of our basic ethical code and understanding of what we know our jobs to be, and it would infuriate us. And that is kind of what is happening in the field of transgender medicine, because there are bad doctors, and there are bad medical writers, who somehow they don't understand the issue, and they're cryptic. Uh, there are people who are paid expert witnesses that are testifying on behalf of these bills who have been thrown out of their colleges and universities because they are bad scientists. You gotta make money somehow, and this is an awesome way to make money, actually, is to do this. And there's also this idea of this, like, this experimentalism. It really is not experimental medicine. And I just want to give you sort of a brief history of trans healthcare. Like, there's so much focus on surgery, but in 1930, Dora Richter was the first person to receive successful vaginoplasty. Um, and this is in you know, Weimar area, Germany. And um, that predates the hip plan transplant by 10 years. It predates uh, LASIK eye surgery by 20 years. It predates penicillin and antibiotics, which were actually originally discovered in 1928, but for a really long time, no one believed him. To, which, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that, that vagina class was 11 years before anyone took penicillin. The first time a heart was stopped and restarted during the surgery, 22 years before that, somebody Thirty-seven years before someone ever had a heart transplant in the world, somebody had a vaginoplasty. Does that sound like experimental medicine to you? Does it sound new to you? It is not. It has been inaccessible to people. It has been something that has been kept secret. But it is certainly not new. It has been done. It is a well-established surgery. There are surgeons all over the world who are very capable of doing the surgery and it actually only takes a few hours. It is not by any means the most complicated surgery in the world, and uh, hormone care, you know, actually did that thousands of years, potentially, when people were using horse urine, actually, to um, uh, take the hormones from that and transition in Mongolia. It's very interesting. There's a huge, long history of trans people and trans healthcare. And one reason that we don't know a lot about that is because the Nazis destroyed the, essentially, like, Library of Alexandria for gay and trans research. Uh, there was a man named Magnus Hirschfeld, who was a gay and Jewish man, who saw that maybe gay and trans people needed to be studied. And this was before World War I and after World War I. And there were people who were walking around Berlin with, essentially, Transsexual licenses. They were able to freely be who they were, wear what they wanted, and they couldn't be punished under dress codes, which were aggressive to begin with. Um, the photos of book burnings are of Magnus Hirschfeld's library and Institute for Sexual Research. Like the image that might come to your mind, that was like the biographical, medical research, everything was destroyed. And also, those people were put in concentration camps and killed during the Holocaust. And in fact, because it was still a violation of the Nazi penal code to be convicted of gender, when the concentration camps were liberated, they were put right back into jail. So it's actually no coincidence that anti-trans like, protests often include Nazis. It has explicitly been part of that idea of ology for a long time. There are deep connections to it. But the one thing I really want you to take away is that Richter survived her surgery but was killed by the Nazis in 1933. Likely. We're not actually sure, but that is probably the most likely outcome of what happened. Um, fringe science exists, and bad research exists, and journalism reprints it all the time. There is a pervasive idea that vaccines cause autism. That study had 12 people and it was garbage. And Andrew Wakefield still makes money off of it. Um, shaken baby syndrome is a 
very well-known bullshit phenomenon. It just isn't true. And yet, all over the country, we still print articles about how we're not sure if shaken baby syndrome is real. It, it is not. And this is a crucial moment to tell basic facts about these things. It is not a confounding thing. The data, as Kay in great detail pointed out, is extremely complex, is worth taking a look at. But these sort of basic historical things can also teach you a lot, and they're not nearly as complicated. Um, so that's all I have to say on that. Do you have anything else to say? Yeah. Um, so a little bit of wrap up, just some resources. Um, there is a bit link if you want to access this because there's lots of links in it. Um, but the Trans Journalists Association does uh, try to you know help out with this sorts of coverage as much as possible. We are a uh, organization of more than 500 transgender journalists in various spheres of media. Um, I am uh, currently a board member, so if you email us, you will probably hear from me. Um, we have a basic style guide that has some sort of general best practices that are less breaking news specific, more just about how do I talk to and about trans people, what are common things that I should avoid, uh, bad tropes, bad assumptions, you know, more of the just like how to write a, a basic sentence about trans people stuff. Um, there's also a, another presentation linked in there uh, along those lines um, from one of our other co-founders. We have some employer best practices documents if you're in someone in a newsroom space where you can make decisions about for instance, past bylines, filing changes, things like that. Um, and a public facing newsletter um, that is all linked here. You can also email contact at transjournalist.org if you have questions and you're on a deadline. Um, and we do newsroom trainings on request as well. Um, sometimes people it depends on uh, who's available and the topics that are requested, but we try to meet as many of those requests as we can. Uh, you can also send jobs to our job listing if you want to hire a trans journalist. Um, our job board is jobs at transjournalist.org. We also have a freelancer database that editors can request access to. It's sort of private because people have tried to use it to harass the freelancer. Um, so you have to uh, provide an organizational email, things like that. There's about 45 people in it right now. Um, and you can also request a speaker for speaking events. Um, so these are all resources that are available. Uh, also, lots of links to basic reporting stuff. Um, my personal favorite thing on this list is a guide to less extractive reporting. It's not trans-specific, um, but it is from the Center for Journalism Ethics, from a great uh, journalism school, and it has some really interesting information thinking about how to approach stories, especially when you are uh, covering something tough like legislation like this where people are extremely impacted and they're high risk for talking to the media and uh, there isn't necessarily a lot of trust built up between journalism communities um, and uh, the communities that we are talking to. Um, also some academic work if people are interested in that. Um, and uh, yeah, if, I will go back actually to the, if you want the, the next slide. So all of this, this slide deck is publicly available. Um, so if you want those links, here's how to get them. Um, that's what we have. Do people have questions? Question regarding um, the part where you talked about having trans and or trans or cis um, mm -hmm. like doctors and sources that you use. I'm wondering, do you recommend maybe altering that depending on who your audience is? Like, for example, if you're trying to tell a transformative story, but your audience is going to be like cisgender middle aged parents that maybe you don't understand. It, yeah, I mean, I think it really just depends on the story. Like, I wouldn't argue you should always have every trans person talking about trans issues is, is a trans source, right? Um, but I do think the main thing is to be, you know, to be thoughtful if you have an entire story about about trans people and it's just cis people talking on it. Um, there are lots of great experts who are cisgender, who, who, you know, especially medical experts. The main thing is just sort of that, like, lack of multiplicity in sourcing. Right. Um, so, and yeah, audience is definitely a factor, angle of story, all of that, you know, standard. Uh, I have definitely 
in, in a lot of my school reporting, there just aren't trans experts. Um, so I have, you know, found the one trans person in the entire country who does the sort of work that is relevant and made sure to get them in the story. And then a lot of the other experts have been cis. The story that would not have been there without um, the experts. So, or if they were not in there with the other experts, rather. Yeah, if I could just add a little bit, like, honestly, no matter where you are, most university healthcare systems have at least some resources, and uh, they'll be more than happy to talk to you. They usually are less well-known doctors, and honestly, from my years of reporting on science, uh, they're just waiting by the phone. They just want to talk to you. You know, researchers who have done work um, often are not being called all of the time. I mean, of course, there are people who like just constantly are answering the exact same questions, but you can find a real diversity of sourcing, like just with basic university healthcare systems. Thank you. Hi. Um, I, I think for a lot of us who are professional reporters, when we, so like if I go out to a protest or a public event, for instance, and I'm interviewing news sources, I've got the script in my mind. Okay, name, age, city of residence, you know, the basic kind of P's and Q's of getting to know someone. Um, I'm curious, do you, in, in your reporting, do you include asking for gender pronouns in that process? Um, if so, is there, a, I mean, what's the method for asking that? Um, and uh, I guess that's my question. Yeah, um, I, I think it's good practice to add, you know, just what pronouns do you use uh, to your sort of like standard source intake? Um, the Open Notebook has some good resources about this. I also really like, uh, I think Open News has some articles about this. There's a bunch of good industry resources you can sort of Google. Personally, the language I actually use is what pronouns would you want me to publish? Because sometimes the answer, like what they want me to use when I'm talking to them, isn't gonna line up. Um, also, some people use multiple pronouns. So like I had a source recently who uses both he and they pronouns and I asked what pronouns he wanted to publish and they asked me to alternate between he and they in the story. So I did that. Um, not every outlet will let you do that, but that will confuse some people. Um, there's we have different recommendations on how to deal with it depending on your audience and format, et cetera. But um, you know, uh, other people who use he, they pronouns have told me just use he. I don't want you to use they publicly. I'm kind of like not out about being non-binary. I don't really want it, you know, in the media, right? So I think just like giving people the opportunity, um, and then also the guide for less extractive reporting talks about this a bit too. Just like kind of walking them through, like here's what we would publish about you. Like here's how it would work. Like pronouns for publications specifically. Uh, if you have the time to sort of have that conversation. I also want to add, there is this like thing that happens in articles a lot, and it is when some a trans person is being interviewed, or it, especially for non-binary people as well, it's like, so-and-so, who uses they, them pronouns, and when they were five years old, put on a dress, and blah, 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 blah and it's like, just use the pronoun. Like, just use it. What does that have to do with What does that have to do with anything? And it's like, Works for the water reclamation district. It's like, <laughs> what the hell? Like, it's just so stupid, and honestly, it's really boring. And like, no one wants to read it, and you don't want to write it, and your editor doesn't want to edit it. And it, but if your editor is like saying, I, you know, I really think that like readers aren't going to understand this. I think people can like subjectively are going to understand when they just like read a word that's a pronoun. I often think we hear all. So um, my goal as a sports journalist is to provide a platform for um, athletes who are part of marginalized groups with sports and hegemonic masculinity. Um, how do you as a journalist kind of balance producing work that advocates for these marginalized groups while battling the people in power who are anti-trans or anti-marginalized you know, marginalized group? I'm going to ask about this one because I don't do any sports reporting whatsoever. Um, I think a lot of my personal, like, sort of pulling it away from sports specifically, I guess, is like, a lot of times it's about, you know, 
ethics, you know, what are the fundamentals of our profession, like how, what, what are the stories that we're telling about people, whose voices are we elevating, and giving people the opportunity to talk about how these things, you know, are impacting them and their communities. Like, I, I've seen some really good articles, you know, a trans sports player gets banned, that's not just an impact on them, right, that's also an impact on the team, on the league. There are huge ripple effects from this stuff, even if it only affects one person in the legislation. And I think trying to be thoughtful about like the way you're talking to that one person, and this is like a hard conversation for people, um, but that, that there's also you know systems of power that you have to speak to. I think the biggest mistake I see is you talk to the person and it's this sort of like, oh, okay, I, I parachuted in, I talked to them, I got the sad quote, I made the sad trans person lead, I described the pride flags and the trans flags flying in the distance as they walked away from the pitch, and then you don't do anything to address the systems of power in the story. You just use them for a sound bite, right? So that's, that's sort of my, I guess my argument, and like, I've left jobs over being, you know, feeling like I was being asked to tell stories where they just wanted the sad trans person quote, and they didn't want to hold the government to account or really get the facts on the legislation and take the time that needed. Um, and I think, like, you know, just like making sure that if you're doing that kind of interview with someone, you're not just being like, cool, did a nice profile about a sad person, moving on now. You know, try to try to think about the ways that your journalism can have impact, can share information that the public needs, can bring to light things that people don't know, right? In, in ways that matter. Yeah, believe it or not, trans people actually do things other than like cry and be transgender. <laughs> and, like something that you're gonna come up with a bunch in, in sports reporting is like honestly, like pay attention to right wing media in particular because there are a few people who are like like essentially right wing martyrs in the worlds of like women's sports that suddenly I guess all these right wing men really care about. Um, <laughs> it's really touching. Uh, but but actually, like these people are often very much disliked by the other people in their sport <laughs> too. Um, I can tell an anecdote at least. I have a very close friend who is kind of like a, a well-known trans cyclist, and there was like a bit of like controversy in the cycling world, which surely doesn't reach most people because most of us are not part of the cycling world. But um, it was really transphobic, and she's like very much supported by the people in that league. But suddenly, this sort of like obscure story that was plucked out of a sport that mostly wasn't getting any coverage is really important all of a sudden because a trans person allegedly did something bad that they didn't actually do. Like it wasn't based in evidence, and it just is a bad story. And this happens literally all the time. And often these right wing like martyrs are like you talk to other people around them, their teammates, people who have competed with them. Like often there is a pattern of like abuse that leads up to these stories where like there's a trans person who has often been like taking a lot of crap from someone and not saying anything, and then that person suddenly comes out of the woodwork and benefits very much from being like this person with the platform and then they go and they speak and they're put on this like speaking circuit. Like it, it is like really a manufactured controversy thing and it's so tied into the world of sports and if you're dealing with sports that have transgender athletes, super important. Again, if you're talking about states like Montana, like SB 99 right now, ban healthcare there. For trans youth, there are 500 trans kids in Montana maybe. And there's a bill for, you know, trans uh, athletes on teams. Where are these trans athletes? Like, find them. Those are the kind of things to ask, like, who are these people and what is the context of, like, the social environment they are currently in? What do the communities have to say about this? Because if there's just one person who is like, I'm so mad about this happening, and every other person is like, it's not a story, you know? It just isn't. But the story is that it has become a story. And I think if you want to do like supportive work, myth busting is actually the most supportive work. In a lot of cases, it is not all about representation. Basic fact check. Basic fact checking. No one's doing. You know. No.
basic fact check. <laughs> and I can give an anecdote from my own reporting. I did the story in Aberdeen a couple years ago. Aberdeen had the first elected transgender representative in Washington State, and nobody knew about it. Yet she was in this big international news story because the dude who ran the Star Wars store in Aberdeen was like really transphobic to her, and they got in a screaming match, and like all of a sudden that's a news story in England. But there was this really amazing story behind that. She like cared about the flooding in Aberdeen and was like this super mild mannered lady, and no one had a problem with her in Aberdeen. That's the story. It's representative. It also tells the story about that town, which is like one of the like most misunderstood and maligned places in Washington. People are like, oh, I guess Kurt Cobain was really sad and must suck. But that's how people <laughs> treat Aberdeen, and it sucks because it's an interesting fucking place. And like, do good reporting about those places, about those communities, and you'll get something so cool and rich that like, I don't know, those other stories like are lame. And why why focus on something being sad when you can tell something great? And I think, like, big picture, one of the biggest problems that we keep circling around is, right, like, people, you know, we're all strapped for time. We're in newsrooms, we've got quotas. But <laughs> the scale of the legislation, its impacts, not just on trans people, but on the broader LGBTQ community and people in the community with it, et cetera, is so huge that you really have to be thoughtful and take the time. And, you know, if you're a reporter, fight your editor for the time to do the extra fact checking. Don't just quote the government press release. Like, if you're an editor, try to make that time if you're covering these sorts of stories, right? Like, it, it really just does come down to making the time to do the reporting um, and, and, you know, ask the questions and be thoughtful um, in a way that you can't always under deadline. And real quick, if I may, if you're if the main story, if you have a trans athlete who's the live source, if you're trying to find an expert source, but they don't hold these positions of power to make the change, who do you look for to get a well-rounded balance of sources? In one sense, like in, like, like, in sports. like state sporting legislation, or that, like, or youth sports, or like international sports. Like if the IOC, like the International Olympic Committee, is supporting this, but then you have state legislation that's not. How do you get an expert? Email me at contact at transjournalists.org and I will put you in touch with one of our many sports reporters. <laughs> yeah, we're like, yeah, no, we're the nerd contingent. Yeah. Um, I've you. got data. Thank you. <laughs> I can tell you about the history of like pharmacy and what people say. <laughs> But um, as far as reporting on issues when um, already um, some topics regarding trans health care um, can be really tricky to talk about, especially in rural communities, um, now that we're getting all this legislation coming forward, what are some tips both of you have for reporters to make sure safety is like at the forefront of their mind when navigating trying to build like strong sources and kind of an accurate portrayal of how legislation could affect the community. Are you talking about like the safety of yourself or the safety of your sources? Sources. Or I mean I guess yourself, I was thinking like if like as a cis reporter if I'm reporting on a trans community. Like safety yeah. of the source. Yeah. That's a really great question. I mean I think that a lot of trans people who are like speaking out right now are like they are often in a position where I think to a degree, I mean, maybe they, they know the, the risk that they're like taking to talk to a reporter. I think it is really being like conscious of the kinds of like questions you're putting out there. I think we don't talk enough in journalism about reminding people what it means to talk to a reporter. Because yeah. there are people who will talk to you and they'll tell you a lot of personal stuff and like start those conversations with like, you know, hey, I just want to back up. This is what on the record means. This is what off the record means. This is how you use these things. When you're talking to marginalized groups of any kind, that is something to just like put out there. They might be a lot more wary of you after that. They might get a lot more nervous. They might back off a little bit, and they should be. You know, like Dylan Mulvaney was, like, was in a Bud Light app like a week ago, and now people that are trying to blow up breweries. I mean, that's pretty wild. That, that, that's pretty wild stuff. And like, 
people who are speaking out right now like know that unique leaders, like you don't want to just like, talk to the same people again and again. There are community leaders who like know that speak to you. Um, also talk to the people who are around them who are cis. Represent the community that like is supportive of them. That kind of goes back to something I said earlier, but like rural people, like, you know, I'm from Texas and like I grew up around a lot of conservatives and like there are a hell of a lot of conservatives in this country who don't hold the beliefs that we expect them to. And like as you know that, like communities are like so simplified and like there is a you know you, you can kind of like protect those people in a way by showing like the plurality of these communities and the complexity of those communities do you want to add yeah um so i reported in missouri for six years uh so i ran into this a lot um and like one of the things was you know having really clear conversations about it first about like okay how much information do we really need from people what sort of person do we really need to talk to? Like being having like that sort of just like newsroom level conversation about like what like you know when we are planning this story from the ground up, like how are we sourcing this and why? And and like making sure like can I offer someone anonymity or just use their first name or just use their middle name? Um, one thing that St. Louis Public Radio does a lot because uh, they've been uh, due to the healthcare clinic uh, laws. Uh, reporting with specifically trans children ages like 11 to 13. They take photos of them from, from the back of the head. Um, and lots of ways, like, and they, uh, or they only talk to their parents. Um, you know, there, so there's lots of ways that you can, like, uh, obviously children are a lot trickier than trans adults in terms of, like, protecting privacy ethics, et cetera. But, like, having those newsroom conversations about, like, what do we do? So it's not just on you as the individual reporter to be, like, I'm gonna make a call in the field, I guess, and then maybe I can't even honor that the thing I said about maybe being anonymous. That sucks, right? Like have those conversations at the newsroom level so that there's some sort of policy, even if it's informal. Like Chalkbeat has like a whole policy about how we talk to students and um, things like that. Like there's not a trans student specific policy, but like it's written down, it's important, and when we run into it, it you know, it's useful to have it because we already know the rules, right? So uh, that's one thing. Number two, read that extractive reporting guide. It talks to a lot of what Vivian mentioned just in terms of like, here are the things that people don't understand about you know, being quoted and how you know, permanent and persistent that information can be on the internet, how to explain what on versus off of record means, things like that. Like it, it has a great checklist of just talking people who aren't familiar with the media through the process of like being a source. Um, other thing, yeah, I would also definitely second, like look at who's already public. Even though we don't want to be quoting the same people over and over again, like there are people who have sort of like designated themselves as risk takers in given communities um, for these reasons. Finding those people is often the, the best way to go because if you, I mean, I did one story um, on, in Missouri when there was a, uh, a really big civil rights um, concern related to some, some Supreme Court stuff, and I talked to 18 people. Um, because my editor really wanted someone who had never been quoted before in, the, in, in, a, in a news story uh, about specifically uh, employee rights in Missouri. And not one single person could afford to go on the record because they were going to lose their job. They were going to be outed. They were actively being discriminated against by their employer. They had ongoing you know, discrimination lawsuits. So I found someone who had already filed a lawsuit um, via the NLRB, or filed a lawsuit is not the right Right, turn right there. But they won a complaint against the writer via the NLRB in the past, like five years ago. No, they didn't speak to you. They have no they are already based in the community. They have interaction. They ended up being the best source, even though they weren't like the you know the new trans face on the news story, because they didn't have these risk factors that made them, you know, that made it like ethically really tricky to put them in that sort of story. And then I also talked to you know other people at rallies and things like that who are willing to give sound bites, whatever. Um, but uh, you know when it comes to like that really like if it's something really sensitive like employment, healthcare, things that people need to live, that's especially where I think it's important to be like super cautious about how you, what thinking through what you really need for the story and are there ways you can get it that will be less dangerous for 
person being quoted in it. I just want to add one more thing. It's sort of just like sort of trans-specific insight as well. Like when people first come out, they might actually be really excited to like share a lot of stuff. It's like a time where I think people are like really open on the internet and they're sharing a lot of personal details. And it's just like this time in your life you transition where you like sort of feel like you have been underwater for a long time and you come up and you're like, whoa. Um, those people are, they, they carry themselves with a lot of confidence, but there is like a truth that they might be super vulnerable and not show that. Like just be sort of, talk to these people like kind of where they are and they're like, and like really do a good ch uh, check with yourself of like, does this person have like a support system around them or are they just like, really feeling optimistic and like, because you could end up putting something inadvertently in a position where like, they have never dealt with like, a lot of like, outward discrimination and they just get piled on online. Because maybe you found that source because they, they were posting online, which is like a super common way to find trans people. And because it's hard to find trans people sometimes, because it's like, demographic data. And you know, it's all kinds of reasons. But like, just doing a real gut check with yourself, and I think it's a great thing for every story of every kind of person, but like, what's going on with this person? Like, would I, could I like unleash a torrent of hate upon them? Oh yeah. <laughs> great questions. Oh, thank you so much. For this will be the last question. So as a digital director, part of my job is to manage our social media channels, and um, I really struggle with the, you know, the tandem and the balance between digital safety and also, you know, um, having our social media channels be a place where people can find community and share resources. And um, I think because in the past, when we have reported on trans, the trans community, unfortunately, we've gotten some you know, comments that I would define as harassment. So now my immediate reaction when we do publish stories is to just not allow comments. Mm -hmm. And then it's sort of like, well, that's too bad because, you know, then we're, we're, we're losing out on all the positive aspects um, like of what our social media could do with that community. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how to, how to <laughs> it's really, it's a, it's a tricky one. Yeah, I was gonna say, this is why I don't do social media management because <laughs> um, it's a hard question. Um, I mean, I, I've worked in newsrooms in the past that do have policies that they apply pretty across the board for all issues, so it's not like a, oh, you're deleting all the negative anti-trans comments, you can just point to a policy and say, we do this on anything. Um, so that's that's part of it, is having good existing like anti-harassment policies, whether that's for your reporters or your readers, you know. Um, and uh, also like ways that like not tagging trans sources and things like that um, can just be small ways to like, uh, you know, still post the story and have some engagement on it, but have the like harassment element, like someone would have to go click six times and use Googling to go harass the person versus you're just adding them and then they can click through and immediately tweet it, things like that. Um, so like, I would say like reading up on like sort of standard anti-harassment practices on social and like thinking about how can we apply these maybe user-wide and beef up our policies for this generally um, in a way that also means that we can some more of those trans stories without as many issues. Yeah, yeah, our, what we do is, so we have a really canned response that we use for any one that we would define as like vulnerable, so like if there's like a minor in the story or something like that, and we, we shut down the comments and then we leave a little blurb that just says, you know, we strive to protect communities or, or groups that could be, you know, vulnerable. Um, but it's just like, it's too bad, yeah, because it, it could be, and maybe that's just sort of the byproduct of yeah. The the medium it's we're shutting down you know the ability to yeah create community share resources but you know we won't. our policy didn't start out this way but because it's, it's happened enough times it's just sort of like why risk the, my feeling now is like why risk further traumatizing people and us sort of shutting it down and that might be the call I mean we I, I think a lot of places have been turning on comments that's like sort of digital en engagement spaces and like I don't necessarily think that's Thing in all cases. Um, but one thing that St. Louis Public Radio does that I have really enjoyed is um, I keep mentioning them because I used to work there. Um, the uh, is they have like a more like private like Facebook page that's sort of like a group community page where like you have to request access and be like here's my 
interact with the reporters and behind the scenes. So there's a lot of that community building, um, but there's also sort of like more of a social expectation of good behavior because it is an actual community space versus like a public forum. Um, so they do get a lot of like very good interaction on trans stories on that space to some degree because there's sort of like a social contract there that doesn't exist <laughs> just like on the internet. Um, so I don't know like if that's the sort of thing that your user might be interested in at some point, but that's actually how they ended up dealing with a lot of that, like, in this one place, but we want to build that community and build that engagement. Can we change the forum? Um, yeah. Thank you. No, that's a great answer. Okay, and uh, give me a round of applause. Thanks, Thank you.